All right, great. Welcome back, everybody. So this is the second lecture in our series on the uh, discrete or fast Fourier transform. So I'm just going to write up um, a little bit of the important stuff that we learned from the last lecture. So we have um, the discrete Fourier transform given by discrete Fourier transform. And the basic idea here is that I have some data. Okay, I have data, um, let's say data F0, F1, F2 dot 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 all the way to Fn minus one. This is my data. And what I would like to do is I'd like to break this data down into a sum of sine waves of different frequencies and I want to know what is the amplitude of each of those sine waves. How much energy is in each frequency? So the output that I want are these f hats, f0 hat, f1 hat, fn minus 1 hat. This, these hats just tell me that I'm dealing with frequency amplitudes, um, or rather amplitudes of sine waves of a particular frequency. And we achieve this by means of something called the discrete Fourier transform matrix. <coughs> okay, so we let omega n equal e to the 2 pi i over n, to the minus 2 pi i over n. Okay, this is our fundamental frequency, kind of our sampling frequency, if you will. And then what we're going to do is compute the discrete Fourier transform, the DFT, by multiplication of my data with this matrix. And the matrix is one, 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 omega, n, uh, dot, 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 one, dot, 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 one, dot, 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 omega, n to the power n minus one, uh, omega, n to the power n minus one, and omega, n to the power n minus one squared, okay? So this is our F matrix and our F data. So if I have a vector of data times this matrix, that gives me my vector of F hats. This is kind of the discrete Fourier transform matrix. Okay, so nothing too complicated. Um, it's a relatively simple thing to make this matrix and to multiply it by a vector of data. Not so bad. Okay, um, and last time we found that this method scales like order n squared computational complexity. Computational complexity. Good, okay. What that means is that if this is a vector of length n, right, I have n samples, then it's going to take n squared calculations to get my frequency components. Uh, and if I double the length of my data, it quadruples my computational cost. So it's not great, but it's not terrible um, in general, right? Um, OK, so it's not great, but it's not terrible. So now I'm going to introduce something called the fast Fourier transform. I'm going to go over here. So that was the DFT. Um, the DFT is order n squared. But now we're going to talk about something called the fast Fourier transform. Now, you've almost certainly heard of this before. It's kind of the most famous uh, algorithm of the last 50 years. It's the rock star of numerical algorithms. It's the fast Fourier transform. Okay, the fast Fourier transform is called the FFT, not to be confused with the DFT. But interestingly, the fast Fourier method is a, is a method of computing the discrete Fourier transform. So this is a method of computing 
the discrete Fourier transform. So the FFT and the DFT over on the right board compute the exact same thing, right? They compute this vector of frequencies from my data, and they give the exact same answer. But the FFT is much, much faster. So the FFT is much faster. This is a computational uh, scientist's kind of ideal scenario. It's order n log n computational complexity as opposed to order n squared. <coughs> okay, and just to reiterate, I should write this down. This is one of the most important algorithms that's ever been developed. Okay, one of the most important uh, algorithms ever developed. Now that's a pretty strong statement, right? There's some pretty important algorithms out there, but this really is one of the most important ever developed. This is uh, ubiquitous in all of the modern computations that make our world the place that it is today. Okay, so I can't, I can't overemphasize how important this is. Um, every time you make a phone call on your cell phone, you're using the FFT. Every time you watch your digital television, you're using the FFT. Every time you listen to compressed music or images or video, you're using the FFT. But it goes way, way beyond just kind of the electronics and telecommunications aspect. In addition to telecommunications, uh, kind of telecom and media, there's also this great world of physics simulations. So most of the interesting physics that we're trying to solve in the modern era are partial differential equations. So for example, I have a beam and I strike it with a hammer and it starts to oscillate. Well, oscillation sounds a lot like Fourier components, okay? Maybe another example is that I have my Boeing 747 wing and I have the fluid flow going past this. The fast Fourier transform gives me one of the most efficient methods of solving the partial differential equations for fluid flow, elastics, all kinds of physical systems. Really, FFT is the thing that is at the heart of all of these simulations, okay? So the fact that we have cutting edge uh, compressors and gas turbines and our power plants that are, the, are incredibly efficient. The fact that we have um, simulations of our nuclear stockpile instead of actually testing bombs now, all rests on the fast Fourier transform. We would not be able to do it if it wasn't for this algorithm. Okay, I wanna drive this point home. Uh, this is such an important point to make. So let's just get a feeling for the difference between order n squared and order n log n. Doesn't seem like, <coughs> doesn't seem like it's uh, maybe as profound as it is. Okay, so the DFT is order n squared and the FFT is order n log n. Okay, so we're gonna do a really simple example now. We're going to think about, uh, let's say I wanna take the Fourier transform of 10 seconds of audio data, okay? Either I have a microphone and I'm trying to listen to some signal and back out its Fourier components. Uh, maybe I'm trying to compress my favorite MP3 and all I have is a 10 second clip. Okay, so the example we're going to do is um, 10 seconds of audio. That's not a lot, right? 10 seconds of audio doesn't seem like a big deal. 10 seconds of audio. Well, what is audio uh, data sampled at? What's the sampling rate for audio data? I'm sure a lot of you know this, you probably some audio files. Okay, so the sampling rate 
is 44.1 kilohertz. This is almost always what audio is sampled at. Uh, it's well above what humans can hear. I think human hearing cuts off in the 20 kilohertz range. Mine's lower. As you get older, uh, you lose your high frequency hearing, unfortunately. Rats have pretty high frequency. They can hear up to 40 kilohertz, I believe. Um, audio is sampled at 44.1 kilohertz, which means that's 44,100 samples per second. Okay, so 10 seconds of audio is about 400,000 samples. It's about 400,000, that's a lot of samples, okay? And that's N, this is equal to N. That's our number of samples. <coughs> okay, so what is N squared? It's actually a little bit more, it's just like 40, 440,000, I mean, might as well do it exactly. This is how many samples we have. So what is N squared? Okay, the DFT is order n squared. Well, if I take 4.41 times 10 to the fifth power squared, what do I get? Um, did I do that right? Yeah, that's right. Actually, I'm just gonna check myself. So I have 44100, that's, uh, Okay, 441,000 squared is huge. That is a huge number. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, 10 seconds is really, really bad. <laughs> Let's try one second. Let's try one second of audio, right? That should be even easier. One second of audio is just 44,100 samples. Let's say that this is equal to N. So order N squared is on the order of two billion, that's billion with a B, floating point operations to compute the traditional DFT, right? That's just this number squared, um, yep. But order n log n, so the log of 44,000 is about five or six, and so this is approximately one quarter million floating point computations. So what that says is that to compress or to take the FFT of one second of audio data, we get an 8,000 times speed up. Okay, this is the basic step that's required every single time you want to compress an audio signal and transmit it over the internet or over the satellite network. So when I pick up my phone and call someone, my voice over a small amount, small window of time is being compressed and sent throughout the network. And so if we were using the traditional DFT, it would be almost 10,000 times slower for every second that I had to compress, which would just destroy your battery uh, in addition to making it basically impossible to compress signals in real time. So the FFT has opened up so many tremendous opportunities in signal processing, uh, compression, data transfer, as well as solving uh, hard physics problems, okay? Do the example yourself. Try 10 seconds and you'll see that it's much worse than before, okay? It gets, it gets more worse the larger the numbers are. Or rather, FFT is more faster for the bigger the signal I'm trying to transform. Okay, good. Um, that was kind of the introduction I wanted to give you about the Fourier transform, rather the fast Fourier transform. <clears throat> and so now I think I should tell you a little bit about how it was created. Um, so this algorithm was invented, I think, just about 48 years ago by Cooley 
and Tuki. So Cooley and Tuki in 1965. And this was at, uh, I believe Cooley was at IBM and Tuki was at Princeton. I don't know if they were friends or not or competitors or what, um, but they were at IBM and Princeton. So this is interesting. Very often in these great numerical algorithms, you'll see Princeton and Bell Labs. So it's interesting that here we have IBM and Princeton, kind of a change of pace. So in 1965, Cooley and Tuki came up with this fast Fourier transform algorithm which changed everything, okay? What's truly remarkable, um, and I, it's almost hard to believe, but this is certainly true, it was actually discovered 160 years earlier by Gauss, by Carl Frederick Gauss. So it was actually discovered by Gauss in 1805. So I think we should let that sink in for a little bit. Cooley and Tookie changed our worlds. They made satellite communications possible in 1965. But it turns out that Gauss had discovered the fast Fourier transform in his notes 160 years earlier. 160 years earlier. There were no computers. They hadn't any notion of mechanical uh, electronic computation. He did all of his calculations by hand or in his head. And apparently, Gauss got sick of doing the very expensive discrete Fourier transform and decided to cook up an algorithm that was way faster. Okay, there's some beautiful number theory underneath this fast Fourier transform that's kind of outside of the scope of this class. But Gauss really knew about that, um, and he thought it was a cool algorithm. Sometimes people will tell you that he thought it was useless, but he certainly did not. He really valued that algorithm, but he just didn't have the electronic infrastructure of the time to capitalize on it. He discovered it actually to solve uh, the motion of planetary bodies, which was the driving force for most science and discovery in that era. Pretty profound stuff. This was two years before Fourier ever wrote any of his papers on harmonic analysis. So there wasn't even the notion of a Fourier transform when Gauss discovered this fast Fourier transform method. Pretty remarkable. Okay. Okay, so we have some time left. Uh, there's a couple of things that I really want to do today. Um, really, there's two things that I want to do today. The first one is I think I should give you just a flavor of what the fast Fourier transform is doing. And then I want to give you some examples about how this can be used on audio data. Okay? So, so just a little bit of uh, material here. I'm really, uh, I'm not going to give you the full story of the fast Fourier transform. It's, it's not really terribly complicated, but it's a little technically involved. Um, and it doesn't really matter to us. Um, I think as Gilbert Strang, the great uh, linear algebraist would say, any modern machine worth its salt has an FFT algorithm built in. Probably my alarm clock has an FFT somewhere in it. So really, we don't need to know how to program the FFT. We kind of can take it for granted. But I should tell you just the kind of nugget of of math that allows the FFT to work. Okay, so that's what I'm going to show you right now. Okay, fast Fourier transform. And of course, I will include all of my lecture notes uh, in a PDF online so you can work through this at your own pace. The basic idea is that the discrete Fourier transform, that big matrix multiplication, can be performed much more efficiently if my number of samples is a power of two. Okay, much more efficiently. The discrete Fourier transform may be implemented much more efficiently if 
n the number of data points or the number of samples is a power of 2. Right? So, for example, I could have x0, x1, x2, dot, 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 all the way up to x1023. This would be uh, 1024 entries, which equals 2 to the power 10. So, this is a power of 2. So, the basic idea is that if I have a power of 2 as the number of samples, I can implement the DFT way more efficiently. Striking how much more efficiently. <coughs> okay, so how does this go? So define, we're going to say that this matrix um, F1024 is a matrix taking my data, x, to my Fourier coefficients, x hat. Okay, taking data to Fourier coefficients. And I'm using the notation here that I found uh, from Gilbert Strang, um, a great linear algebra textbook. And I think that this is a really nice way to think about it. Um, incidentally, he actually has a beautiful entire course on linear algebra on the MIT Open Course where. So this is a great resource for any you know, particular topic in linear algebra you're interested in. You can go and find kind of this brilliant lecture by one of the greatest linear algebraists alive today. So we write that uh, this vector x hat of Fourier coefficients is equal to this big 1024 matrix times my data. This is a 1024 by 1024 matrix, which means it has just over a million entries. That's a lot of uh, entries, right? OK. So the nugget of the idea here, um, and it's a pretty cool idea, The nugget of the idea is that if we have a, a 2 to the power p number of samples, so I'm on the left board now. So if we have x hat equals our matrix f1024 times our data x, then what I can do is break this down into x hat equals some matrix times a matrix F512, F512, 0, 0, and then all of the uh, even X entries and all of the odd X entries. Now, this is a little bit of a weird notation. I'm going to tell you what this all means in a minute. Uh, I think this is right. So. <coughs> F512 is the 512 by 512 uh, discrete Fourier transform matrix. It's a lot smaller than F1024. And so this thing, half of it is zeros. So right off the bat, we've saved a factor of two in multiplications. And all I had to do was take my x vector and pick out all of the even entries, right? x2, x4, x6, x8 and all of the odd entries, x1, x3, x5, x7, and so on, and stack them, multiply them, and then multiply them by this kind of detangling matrix. So I've, I've pulled out the evens, I've pulled out the odds, and here I have to reshuffle them back together and weight them. Um, this is the identity matrix, and D is an easy to compute diagonal matrix um, I say easy to compute because, like, uh, this is like 5, 12, minus 1. Easy to compute because it's mostly diagonals. So multiplying by this is trivial. There's almost no operations involved. So multiplying by F512 is the expensive part of this calculation. Okay. 
You can really actually see this if you write the formula for the discrete Fourier transform. So let's see if I can uh, find this in my lectures. So if I actually write down the formula for the DFT, right, my uh, x hat k equals the sum from n equals 0 to big N minus 1 of x n e to the minus 2 pi i k n over big N. And so the basic principle here is pick out all of the even coefficients here and write that as one sum. And then pick out all of the odd coefficients and write that as another sum. And you'll find that you get two smaller 512 sums in terms of something squared. And if you reshuffle and reorganize, you can find, in fact, this is a great exercise if you really want to know what's going on here. Try to take this expression for n equals 1024 and show that it's exactly equal to this expression. Okay, this is a great exercise and you'll really know what's happening with the FFT. Okay, we don't really have time to get into that right now. So right off the bat, going from 1024 to 512 has saved us a factor of two in the expensive calculations. Okay, this, this part here is the expensive part, multiplying by this matrix, and we've saved a factor of two. But the great thing is that F512 can be broken up into two copies of F256 now. Right, now... We can cut that in half again, that's half as expensive. And F256 can be broken up into um, F128, 128. And so now you can see why we want powers of two, because we can keep doing this 128 to uh, 64, to 32, to 16, to eight, to four, to two. I mean. You can go all the way down the line, and every time you do that, you, you make a factor of two savings in the computation. Okay? So that's how you get the order n log n speed up. And it gets you know, better the bigger your numbers are. <coughs> okay, good. Let's see. Is there a last point I want to make? There is a last point I want to make. And that last point is the following. Even if my number of samples is not equal to 2 to a power, so even if n does not equal 2 to some power, the best strategy is to actually add zeros at the end of my vector until it is a power of 2. So we say just pad with zeros. So now I have my data x and a big bunch of zeros until this thing has two to the p elements, uh, until it does have two to the p uh, samples. And it turns out that even making your vector bigger, as long as you make it a power of two, will make this much, much, much more efficient uh, to solve. Okay, so this is the basic idea of the fast Fourier transform. Like this is just scratching the tip of the surface, um, but it's a really phenomenal algorithm, useful in so many fields. Um, you can really attribute a lot of the modern era to this one algorithm, which is uh, kind of special. Good, okay, so now what I want to do um, now that we have this part of the lecture, I want to dive into a few more numerical examples. Okay, so theory is great, but we want to see rubber hit the road. Okay? Okay, so let's go to MATLAB. Okay, last time we ran this script where we created a signal which was a sum of sine waves. And we took the FFT and saw that the frequencies we expected were the dominant frequencies. So let's just run this again to remind ourselves, because it's been a while, perhaps. OK, I'm going to clear everything. I'm going to create my sum of sine waves. And then I'm going to take the FFT of my signal. 
<coughs> I'm going to compute the power spectral density, which is my Fourier coefficients um, magnitude squared, and I'm going to plot them. And these are the, the dominant uh, power peaks. These are the frequencies that contain all of the energy or the power of my original signal, which is good because those are exactly the frequencies that I was looking for. Uh, I created a sine wave with frequency 50 hertz plus 120 hertz, and lo and behold, I get 50 hertz and 120 hertz. Okay, this is just review from last time. I don't even think there is a DFT algorithm in MATLAB. I think it only lets you do the FFT because you'd be crazy to do anything else. So like if I type DFT, it says undefined function or variable. But if I say FFT, it says please give me more input arguments and I'll compute the FFT really quickly. Okay, so we're gonna do something a little more uh, kind of meaty today, a little more interesting. And it's not, it's not really terribly profound, but it's kind of cool. We're going to add some noise to our signal, okay? Y equals X plus a lot of noise uh, times the size of my vector. So rand n is normally distributed Gaussian white noise. That means it has mean zero and unit standard deviation. And if you give rand n a vector, or the size of a vector, it'll give you a bunch of random numbers of the same size. Okay, so I'm gonna plot my original signal next to my noisy signal. And I wanna plot this in red, I believe. And I'm going to make a legend that says the first signal is clean and the second signal is noisy. Cool. All right, so this is great. Um, here we see the blue signal is our actual uh, sum of two signs frequency. And this red is just a lot, a significant amount of noise added to my signal. Now, if you just looked at the red curve, you might say to yourself, that looks like it has four or five frequencies, and I bet you wouldn't pull out 50 and 120 just by eye, okay? <clears throat> okay, so now instead of taking the Fourier transform of my clean data, X, I'm going to take the transform of my nasty, noisy data, Y, Okay, and so now we see, this is the FFT of my noisy data. We still see these beautiful peaks at, now it's 49.95, right, 50 hertz, <coughs> and 120 hertz. But there's this significant noise baseline that exists now because uh, we added a lot of noise, right? We added noise that kind of has, so white noise is known to have, um, power at all frequencies, which is what you're seeing here, is this kind of uniform power at all frequencies. Um, so this is really cool that the FFT is giving us a very clear readout on the frequencies that are under all of this noise, all of this noise. Great. Um, well, so now I start thinking to myself, maybe I can use the power, like maybe I can use this power spectrum to actually filter my signal. Right? I know that if I have a big peak, it's probably not just noise, and everything else is a coincidence and I can throw it away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if my power spectral density is lower than 50, that's about the cutoff here, I'm gonna set it equal to zero manually. I'm just gonna zero out the noise baseline, the noise floor, and then I'm going to inverse Fourier transform and try to reconstruct my signal. <coughs> All right, so let's see what I want to do here. Um, I really want this in a subplot. Okay, and I'm going to have a code that uses uh, the power spectral density to filter out noise. Okay, indices equals PSD greater than 50. So PSD was a big vector I created. 
And here what I'm doing is if any of those entries are greater than 50, the, that position of the indices vector will have a one in it. All the variables that are lower than 50 will have a zero. So this is gonna be a big vector, the same size as PSD, with zeros wherever PSD is less than 50 and ones where it's greater than 50. This is really cool. This is a logical uh, statement to fill a vector. You can use it to fill a matrix too. And then I'm just gonna say PSD equals PSD dot times indices. So wherever the indice is one, meaning that I had a large power at that band, I'm gonna keep it, I'm gonna multiply it by one. Wherever there was very little power, and I think it might be noise, I'm gonna multiply it by a zero index. So this zeroes out all others and removes the noise floor. I'm gonna use jargon so that you get a feeling for it. That's called the noise floor. Okay, I'm gonna hold on, and I'm gonna plot my frequency uh, L versus my new PSD L in red. Uh, this is my original and filtered, filtered. Okay, good, I think I killed my computer. Because it's not called legend, it's called legend. Good, all right, so we had the data, um, we added a bunch of noise to it, then we looked at the FFT, the power spectral density in particular, the, the magnitude square of those Fourier coefficients. So my coefficients, you know, F0 hat, F1 hat, I look at the square magnitude of those things and that's this power spectral density here. Now the red curve is my filtered one where I zero out all of this kind of blue noisy crap and all I'm left with are these nice, perfect, clean red peaks. And the only last step is to inverse Fourier transform. <sighs> okay, so my Fourier coefficients, y, I'm going to multiply them by my indices, dot times indices. So I'm gonna zero out small Fourier coefficients in y. And then I'm gonna say y filter equals the IFFT, the inverse for fast Fourier transform of y. And this is the inverse FFT to get filtered time domain signal. Okay, and now all I have to do is plot it. So I'm gonna go back to my figure one. I'm gonna to go to my subplot and I'm gonna plot time x, um, the true clean signal in blue. And then I'm gonna hold on and plot the filtered signal in red. Uh, and I want an axis just to see what's happening. Nah, forget that. Okay, something died. Um, I need a parenthesis, okay. All right, so after I filtered out that noise, if I zoom in here, I see that my filtered signal matches almost perfectly to my actual uh, true data. So this is really cool. I didn't know anything about the kind of blue clean signal here. All that I was given was this nasty, noisy red data. So <coughs> from the nasty, noisy red data, I computed the FFT and looked at the power spectrum and I got this blue curve with these peaks and all the noise. I zero out all of the small coefficients, I filter, and when I inverse Fourier transform, I get this beautiful, clean reconstruction, okay? So this is fantastic. The fast Fourier transform has an even uh, another application, right? It can filter beautifully. Let's say I don't have as much of a signal. Instead of from time zero to one, which is a thousand samples, let's say I only have a quarter of a second and I run the same thing. So now this is just a quarter second of noisy data 
And now when I FFT, notice that my 50 hertz is barely above the noise baseline. Um, and if I just looked at this signal, I might actually think I need to cut off at 20, because these look kind of important. So let's cut off our filter at 20. Um, right, so we're actually keeping a lot of nasty peaks, and our reconstruction doesn't do very good. However, if I go back and I make my signal longer, I should probably close all my figures. <coughs> my filtering is significantly better. This is not a very uh, compelling example. Let's try 50. So what I'm trying to say, um, maybe I'm not doing a great job of saying it, so let me try to reiterate. So if I only have a short sample, maybe a quarter second of data, and it's really noisy, I might uh, kind of get spurious um, peaks in the power spectrum, and it's going to be harder to filter. But the solution is quite simple. All I have to do is just wait longer and collect more data. Okay, And my filtering gets better and better. Okay, the last thing we can do is we can actually play the sound. So MATLAB is really cool. You can say sound of Y, one over DT. Uh, let's see if this works. Okay, I'm gonna make it a little bit longer, maybe uh, two or three seconds, just so that you can hear it. So that's what the noisy, two frequency sign sounds like. Let's see what the clean sound wa sine wave sounds like. Much cleaner. I'm not sure if you can hear it. Ah, and my MATLAB dies. OK, so that's the basic, um, the basic idea of using the FFT to filter. OK, <coughs> so I have maybe five minutes left, and I'm going to give you one uh, last cool, well, maybe two cool last examples of the FFT. Um, and this is called the spectrogram. Okay. So I'm just going to run this one more time. Okay. So the spectrogram is this beautiful um, kind of technique that you can use to visualize and analyze audio data. And what it does is really cool. Um, in fact, maybe I'll just do it on MATLAB. I think it's easier. So I have this example called Load Music. Um, there's free open source software called MP3 Read, and you can find it at mathworks.com on the MATLAB Central file exchange. And it's this really cool code that allows you to pull in MP3s. So unfortunately, on the website, I can't share uh, copyrighted music like this Led Zeppelin song. But I can play it in the lecture. So I have a file called zep.mp3. And I'm going to load it in. This takes a little while because it's kind of a big file, maybe 60 megabytes um, uncompressed. And I'm going to play five seconds of the song. This is just me formatting the data. And here, I'm going to plot it, first of all. So this is what the audio signal looks like. And if I zoom in, I mean, this is a lot of data. A lot, a lot of data. <coughs> Let's just play the sound real quick. Uh, let's try it one more time. OK, so that's the first five seconds of a really good Led Zeppelin song. OK. And there's this great built-in command in MATLAB. Uh, it's built in on the student version, at least, called spectrogram. Uh, now, I'm not going to kind of tell you everything about spectrogram. I really think you should type help spectrogram and get a nice uh, overview of all of the bells and whistles that you can apply. 
But basically what the spectrogram is going to do is it's going to take your five second audio clip and it's going to break it up into a bunch of smaller windows and do the FFT in those smaller windows so that you can get a plot of the frequency content in time. Let's see what that looks like. So this is the spectrogram for that, uh, that Led Zeppelin song. Uh, let me just bring it down here so that it stays visible when I play the song again. So the song time is going from left to right, and these are the frequencies represented at each moment of time. So these are low frequencies and high frequencies. Um, and notice these band structures. What do you think that these uh, banded structures represent? Well, these are the chords and the harmonics of these guitar chords being played uh, one after the other. So you can actually see um, time being kept. You know, these are the, the timings of each of these chord transitions and plucking of different strings, okay? So that's kind of cool. Um, I think that there are some really great examples on YouTube, so I'm just going to see if I can find one. Uh, YouTube, not you, but YouTube Spectrogram Beethoven. All right, let's see what Beethoven has, because this is pretty phenomenal stuff. Notice here that there are tons of vertical bands that are excited, that have large Fourier coefficient. Now, the piano player probably doesn't have, I don't know, 50 or 60 fingers. So these are really the harmonics that are being excited um, by these chords and these complex uh, resonating sounds. So anyway, this is just kind of a nice, um, pictorial illustration of the FFT, the, the, the Fourier spectrum. Um, and next lecture, we're going to be talking about images and image compression using the FFT, which is really one of my uh, kind of favorite topics on the subject. Okay, so that's all for today. Um, I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.